Hey, what's up, family? Pastor Ansel McMahon here. Hey, listen, we are so grateful that you're able to take advantage of this Bible resource from Emmaus Church. Every single week, our desire is to preach and teach the scriptures in such a way that is both edifying and encouraging. We want to exalt Jesus, and our desire is that these resources would serve as a supplement to your involvement in a local church wherever you are. It is absolutely critical, according to God's Word, that you be involved in a church, connecting in the church, being in relationships within that church, serving the body of Christ, giving generously, involved in a local church. And so we hope this blesses you. And if it does bless you, consider maybe giving to our ministry here at Emmaus Church. You can do that on our app. You can do that on our website. But until then, just know we're praying for you, and we truly do hope this blesses your life. We gather as a people who have been redeemed. For once we were a people without hope, but now through Christ we have hope. We are reminded of this in 1 Peter 1.3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's because of that truth today that we can also uh, agree with the psalmist in Psalm 30 that says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. Give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Amen. We stand together and we're going to sing this morning. the world
church. church. My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the worship pastor at Emmaus Church, and it's, it's so good to be with you all this morning. So good to gather as a body uh, to sing praises to our God. Amen. And I just want to say a special welcome to any first-time guests we have in the room with us. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we'd love to, to learn your name. So if you would be so kind uh, at some point during the service or some point today, texting welcome to this number on the screen behind me. Um, we'd love the opportunity to call you or text you back or email you or whatever uh, your, um, you know, proper or, you know, whatever kind of form of inf inf communication that you would like to communicate with us. We'd love to get in touch with you. You know when you look for a word, you just don't find it? Well, the Lord is, yeah, I know, right? Uh, but, man, it's, it's, it's good to be together. It's good to sing praises to our God. He is worthy of our praise. Um, we read from Psalm 28. This reminder that the people of God are to be about this. We are to praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. Amen. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. Now, church, can we read this last line together? Ready? I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Would we be a people that burst out? That's, that's a really... Uh, in, you know, exciting word to use, right? Uh, to be a people that burst out. It means it's spontaneous. Uh, I have a, a friend who defines worship as the spontaneous response to the realized presence of God. This idea that God's presence is always about us, always around his people, right? He dwells within us and we're losing lights. It's great. Um, but we are to be a people that spontaneously burst out with thanksgiving because that's how good he is. So would we burst out now with song? Let's sing to him now. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. Cause I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. Amen. So I will.
trust you, Jesus. Rain came and went, blue, and my house was built on you. And I'm safe with you, and I'm gonna make people here this morning declaring your faithfulness, that you are a God who always fulfills what you promise, always does what you say you're going to do. And so we would be a people that believe that today, that put our trust, our hope, our faith in you. And on the name of Jesus, Lord, this world is a, is a dark and dying place full of suffering and full of discouragement and and. and things that would cause us anxiety and fear and doubt, but Lord, you remain always with us. Would Jesus be our firm foundation through all things? Increase our love for Jesus today. And I pray, Lord, now as we move into a time of teaching in a moment that you would open up our hearts and minds to hear afresh from you, that your spirit would move in our, our bodies and our minds and hearts today, that we would leave more like Christ. We pray this all in the matchless name of King Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Esther chapter 9. Now in the twelfth month, 
which is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in the cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the state traps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. And the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha and Delphon and Aspatha and Poratha and Aldalia and Aridatha and Parmashta and Arisai and Aridai and Vaisatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that day a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th rested on the 15th day, making that day a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Hazarus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same, year by year. As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, as on the month they had been turned for them from sorrow to gladness and from mourning into a holiday and that they should make for them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Amadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast poor, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in, written, in writing that the evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they called these days Purim, after the term poor. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and what they had faced in this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written at the same time appointed every year that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation and every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abahai and Mordecai the Jew, gave full written authority, confirming the second letter about Purim, 
Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Hazarus in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons. And Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fasts and their lamenting. The command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. And chapter 10 says, King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the conclusion of this story, this incredible account from Scripture. For those of us that have heard this many times before, Would you reawaken in us the marvel of it all, the drama of it all, and would we glean new things? For those of us that are new this morning, would you help us to stare in awe at the telling of the story that you have written and recorded in your word? Would you use this morning, Brother Watson, to help us and help us glean and and learn and soak in all that this word has to offer Would we praise you for this incredible story? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I have half a mind to just have her read that again and just be done for the day. (laughs) Thank you, Lana. Uh, Okay, so I'm Tom. And uh, I have to thank COVID for giving me the second opportunity in six years to preach. So Anson has got COVID this week. The first time that he has gotten COVID throughout this whole season, I texted with him a few minutes ago, and he just tested negative this morning. He's kind of coming out of it, but anyways, he had COVID this week, so he called me on Tuesday. Last time, I was told that he had some, a bunch of people had COVID and exposure like two days before the sermon last time, and I had, you know, two days to prepare. Was anybody there for that sermon? Especially the, uh, the second the second one where I made the mistake of, uh, so I learned that I should staple my sermon. I don't know if you remember this, but at some point, like halfway through the sermon, I had like some of my, some of my pages, I would do this, and then halfway through the sermon, I'd started putting pages behind my other pages, and I got totally confused about where I was in the sermon. And anyways, y'all were very gracious uh, to me. Uh, so the relationship that we have in Kaihura we are known in Uganda as the Bible people. And uh, one of the reasons for that is because we provided thousands of Bibles to that community. And I'm gonna test, I'm gonna test you today. This is, we, have a, we just read through a lot of scripture. And there is a lot more to come. Uh, there's just gonna be a ton of scripture in this. So we're gonna test whether or not you're actually Bible people or not. So if you can hang with me, then that'll be good. Uh, it should be pretty good stuff. So this is the last the last series in Esther. This is a pretty big week. Last series in Esther. Do we have any camp counselors that are in the service today from this week? Just one made it? Only one made it? Okay, I'm not surprised. Okay, a few people made it. Okay. How was it? Was it good? Good. Okay. I bless you all for doing that. I would never, I don't think I would do that. Um, (laughs) That is camp with kids, uh, my oldest, he's not in here right now, but my oldest son a few years ago, when he was just getting into adolescence, uh, some camp counselors had to tell him to take a, um, a shower th- the week of camp and to change his clothes. Were any of <laughs> anyways, that was embarrassing. That was embarrassing. Uh, but anyways, so we have this, and then we also have kids going back to school. So I know that the parents are thrilled to get kids out of the house. I know that I am. Uh, ours don't go to school until uh, Friday, but I know some of y'all, I think, went to school this past, uh, this past Friday. So anyways, very excited. 
so if this is your first time here, I'm Tom. Brother Watson was what Lana said, thinking never been, been called Brother Watson before, but <laughs> that's a good name. Um, so if this is your first time here, welcome. You're coming in at the very end of a, uh, you know, a, a really wonderful story about how God used imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. And I want to give you a bit of an overview of, um, of the book and then also provide for those that have been here all along a little bit of a, an outline that's, a, that's new, uh, a little bit of a new outline and a new perspective on how to look at Esther. And the way that I was preparing for this sermon, so I read chapter 9 and 10, and, you know, students of Scripture, you start to notice things, especially when you're reading through books of the Bible, you try to read through them, just kind of, if you don't know this, but if you're going to study a book like Esther, you read it multiple times kind of fast so that you can get an overall picture, and then you dig in and you start studying. It's a good way to study Scripture. So because I have done this, when I started reading chapter 9 and 10, you start to see there's these similarities to what's happening in 9 and 10, 10 especially to what happened at the beginning of Esther. More specifically, in verse uh, 3 of chapter 10, it says, For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. But if you remember at the very beginning of the book, it was King Ahasuerus who was also great among many provinces and people, and he spent his efforts uh, in debauchery and throwing parties and doing things that were sinful. So you have this contrast, this, uh, this reversal in the, the story. So we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of Esther. So there's two points. So the first, is the first slide, does it have both points on there? Okay. Okay, so anyways. So we have two points today. I'm going to go ahead and give you the two points. Now, Slide six, I have like 12 slides. I don't know how many you broke it up to, but there's a lot of slides today. About halfway through the slides, there's going to be a QR code so that you can just download the, all of the slides for today. So don't have to worry about making notes for everything. And there's two points today. The first point is that the reverse occurred and it should occur in you. That's the first point. Uh, the second point, and this, and the, sorry, the first point, the first half of the sermon, it's basically going to be like classroom time. There's going to be a lot of like sort of like technical details. This is where I'm going to test your, you know, ability to be, you know, continue to be known as Bible people. So that's point one. Point two is in order for true peace to occur, there must be an honest and thorough dealing with the conflict in front of us. And that's part of the sermon is going to be a little bit more pastoral. And the way that I got these two points, it all comes from chapter nine, verse one, where it says at the very end of that verse, it says the reverse occurred the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. So from that sentence, both two points, we're going to talk a little bit about both chapters from those two points. So on the summary of the, the, whole, the whole book, just for those of you who just walked in, we have to actually start in the book of Exodus to get a running start for the whole uh, book itself. And what I'm going to read to you is the story of and the reason I'm going to do this is it's going to help us make sense of chapter 9, specifically the second day when Esther decides to take a little bit of a different approach and go after more people on the second day and then hang the sons of Haman. So that's like a little bit of a curveball in the story. You didn't expect it, but there's a reason for that happening. In order to see the, the severity of why they decided to do that, we're going to go back to Exodus. So this is the part when I was thinking about Lana reading that I was thinking that maybe just halfway through the sermon, she'd just stay up here the whole time with me and just read every time I want to read scripture, but I think she's left the room. <laughs> so that's, so you're stuck with me. Um, so slide two. So the next one, we're going to read uh, Exodus 17, 8 to 16. And again, this is the lead up to understanding chapter nine of Esther. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, so Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, whenever Moses held it up in his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, and one on the other side. 
So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. When the Lord said to Moses, oh, sorry, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. And Moses built an altar and called it the name of it, the Lord is my banner. I know you've heard that before, the Lord is my banner. Did you know it was connected to Esther? It's interesting. Saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So the interesting part about this story is that in this part in history, the Israelites had just left Egypt. They had been set free from slavery after hundreds of years of being enslaved to the Egyptians. And they had walked through a period where they were hungry and thirsty. If you know the story, they were hungry and thirsty. Moses like hit a rock and then water came out and provided manna and all this kind of stuff, which is amazing. But as soon as that happened, the very first enemy that they encountered in the wilderness was Amalek, the very first enemy. So this is like ingrained in the history of the Israelites. This is part of their experience. So, uh, so the next part in the story is in Deuteronomy. So it comes up again, Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, where it says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail. Those who were lagging behind you and did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So he's again making a, a promise and actually a command of them. Whenever they get into the promised land and are settled, they have to deal with the Amalekites. Uh, so that's another part of the history of God's people. And then we move on to 1 Samuel. So the people are now established in the land. They're becoming more established, and they have just crowned their first king, Saul. Uh, the prophet Samuel had anointed him, and then we move to this story. So one of the very first acts that he had to accomplish as king was to deal with the Amalekites. That was the command that God had given to Saul, which was interesting. So what you see in the story in 1 Samuel, it says, I'm going to piece through a, a few things for the sake of time. But in 1 Samuel 15, it says, and Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of the land of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. So this is a, not a good part of the story. Uh, he was not supposed to be taken alive, but he took him alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commands. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night, and Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. How, how like <laughs> self-awareness is not part of Saul's life at this point. So Saul is setting up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, so this is, I, I love Samuel. So this, this is my kind of guy, like this kind of humor. This is the way that I talk. This is the way that I do humor. It's very dry, but this is what I'm thinking when Samuel is about to read this or to say this. What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? 
which is obviously he's referring to the spoil that Saul took in the battle. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return to you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from the being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So that's a pretty serious consequence for not obeying God's command to take care of the Amalekites, right? Uh, so what I'm wanting you to kind of understand leading up to what we're getting to in Esther is that God had promised because of the Amalekites' uh, behavior towards the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt that he was going to do something about it. And he was waiting for people to fulfill that promise. He kept telling people to do it, and they didn't. And now you can kind of see a little bit of why the actions happened the way that they did with Haman and his 10 sons on the second day. Because this had been ingrained, you can imagine, telling stories about the history of your people. And part of that story is as soon as they left Egypt, they encountered the Amalekites. They had battled them and battled them over the years. And then now we're dealing with, this is in the subconscious of the of the Jewish people. So now we finally get to Esther. What's happened so far in the story? I'll summarize this by describing what was said in 9-1, the reversal occurred. So that's really what the first point is about. So this next slide, this is gonna be a lot of information. Uh, a lot of information. So uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on all this stuff, but you can use this QR code, it'll download. You can go and get the slides from every slide that we talk about today if you want to. Uh, but you don't have to, it's okay. So this is the outline of Esther. And what we're talking about, the reversal occurring, this happens in scripture, uh, literary structure in the Bible is put in a way that it produces a point that the author is trying to communicate. So what we talk about in 9-1, where it starts out by saying that the reverse occurred and then the Jews did what they were supposed to and took care of business, basically. So that's at the very end. So if you see this structure in Esther, you have A and A. So this is the mirror part. This is the reversal part. So at the beginning of the book, we have the greatness of Ahasuerus, where he's talking about all the amazing things that he has. At the end of the book, we have uh, Mordecai talking about his greatness, but the good that he did with it. And then we have the two banquets. The first one was Ahasuerus talking about how amazing he was and doing awful things with that. The second one was a banquet over two days where they were celebrating God's faithfulness. And then you have Esther not wanting to identify as a Jew for fear of what might happen whenever she was being chosen as queen. And then in the second half of the reversal of that, you have in chapter eight, Gentiles identifying as Jews. Then you've got the elevation of Haman, where then he goes on and tries to get everybody to bow down to him. Then the other side on chapter eight, the elevation of Mordecai. Then you have the edict against the Jews, and then you have an edict in favor of the Jews. Then you have Mordecai informing Esther of the plot against the Jews, and then Esther informing Ahasuerus of the plot against the Jews. And then you've got Esther's first banquet, and then you have Esther's second banquet, and then in the middle, it's this turning point. This turning point is kind of the, the center of the story, where God is doing something that changes the events of the whole story. And this is where we go to the next slide, where I think that Peter Lowe has something interesting to say about this talking about the turning point, number, or letter H. For both Haman and the Jews, in chapter six, is the turning point. The whole plot turns on a seemingly unremarkable event, King Xerxes, who is Ahasuerus, inability to sleep, which triggered a series of unlikely events. Although important in the Esther narrative, at this crucial point, the emphasis is not on human planning and action. The turning point was not caused by the actions of the main characters, in this way, the structure of the book reinforces the idea of a hidden hand reversing destinies. So in chapter 1, verse 9, it says that the reverse occurred. 
So we have God working behind the scenes. The people have been given hope at the end of chapter 8. So what are they going to do with the hope? They've been given hope in this new edict so that they can defend themselves. They've been given hope, but it's not fulfilled yet. That Nothing has happened. We enter into chapter 9. They have hope, so what are they going to do about it? Um, the reversal occurs, obviously, as we read chapter 9 and 10. But remember the second half of the first point. As I said, the reversal occurred, and it should happen in you. So this is the part where we sort of talk a little bit about what this should mean for us. It's great that the reversal occurred for the Jews in this day. What should this mean for us is kind of what the point is. And then on the next slide, we'll talk about is the very first great reversal that should happen in your life is your reversal out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Well, you find that in 1 Peter 2, 9. So in this next slide, there are two different, um, two different I guess you would say the reversal. It all, all happens from Romans, and that would be that we are born, so that we'll say Romans 1, 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So on the one side, this is how we're all born. We're born under the wrath of God because of our sin against God. With the great reversal happens, which it should happen in all of our lives, the, be the, the best reversal that should happen in all of our lives is from Romans 5, 6 to 9. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good person one dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. So the reversal in this case, the most important reversal in our life is from going out from under the wrath of God to being uh, one of his children and being in Christ. So that is the great first reversal. But the question is, like, how are we to live? Now, if, if that's you, how should you live? What kind of reversal should happen in your life now? Because this is still, this is the, the, really the way that we live our life is through this idea of reversal, which I'll get, it'll make more sense in a second, because that's not the way that you typically talk about your life, <laughs> is reversal. Uh, but it should be in a continued state of reversal. On the next slide, it says that, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So while we're no longer enslaved to sin, it still wages war against us. This is the reversal that should happen in our lives every single day. We're at war with our flesh. We're at war with our enemy. And by the way, there are people in your life who are doing the same thing, which causes conflict. Um, so this is a constant battle that we face in being um, at war with our flesh. But we're not enslaved to it anymore, thankfully. So John Owen, my favorite author, he says this in his book, The Mortification of Sin and Believers. This is about the constant duty that we have um, to reverse our propensity to sin. He says, if sin be subtle, watchful, strong, and always at work in the business of killing our souls, and we be slothful, negligent, foolish, in proceeding to ruin thereof, can we expect a comfortable event? There is not a day but sin foils or is foiled, prevails or is prevailed upon, and it will be so while we live in this world. So did I mention that we live with people who are going through the same thing, which makes it a little bit difficult to live in peace with people? And this is where we get into our, our second point of the day. In order for true peace to occur, there must be an honest and thorough dealing with the conflict in front of us. And what do I mean by this? So we see in chapter 9 and 10 that the Jewish people thoroughly defeated their enemies. Over 75,000 of them were killed. We're not indicated, there's no indication that any Jews died in the battle. Um, but there are a few things to call out. So in order for true peace to occur, what we saw in chapter 10, verse 3, a lot of things had to happen. People died. A lot of decisions were made that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about more in a little bit. But there are a few things that I wanted to call out from chapter 10. Well, I'm going to 
for the sake of, you know, everybody's time. I, so I'm not going to go nearly as long as Anson does. Uh, so that's to be expected uh, probably. But I'm going to talk, talk about, let's see, I'm going to give you seven points to highlight. And I'm only going to talk really about two. If I have time, I might talk about one or two other ones. But I'm really going to spend some time on two of these. So this is what kind of stuck out to me when I was reading chapter 9 and 10 when we're talking about in order for true peace to occur, there must be an honest and thorough dealing with the conflict in front of us. So the first one is, did, did we get these all in order? Okay. Uh, the Lord prepared the way for the enemy to be fearful. It is interesting in this case, you can see this happening in our lives in the scripture, which I'll touch more on in a second, is that the, the fear of Mordecai was spreading amongst the people. And God was doing that. God does that for us in the way that he prepares the battle for us. He prepares the way. Uh, second point is the community worked together. In two different occasions, it says the Jews gathered together. Number three, the people did not hope by sitting on the sidelines. You can see the references to how they actually got, it, was no, it wasn't just hope. They didn't just hope, they acted. Esther ensured that her enemies were thoroughly destroyed and put on public display. This was the second day. The people were measured and wise in dealing with their enemies. This is seen in the way that they did not take plunder from their enemies. This was expected on the day. People did this whenever they fought. They took plunder, uh, but they did not. The people remembered the faithfulness of God. And the last one, the result of all this was the welfare and peace of God's people. So with all that in mind, I want to focus on just a couple of these, starting with the third point where I said that the people did not hope by sitting on the sideline. Uh, so we often think that peace will happen without conflict. This is what I want to talk about for a bit. There are things under the surface in our relationships where we ignore them with the hope that peace will just happen. There's things that are under the surface that are happening. We ignore difficult conversations and just live in what you could call a false peace. And what's a false peace? We know it when, we, we know it when we're in it, what false peace is. It's a lack of intimacy and connection with people that are close to you. There's something in the way of you being able to open up to other person, so you're not really able to open up your full self to another person that you, are, that you should have a close relationship with, and that's because there's false peace, that's because there's something in between you that is not being dealt with. There's conflict between people, um, and I'll mention later, uh, whenever you're dealing with conflict, so. There's this something that's in between you, and oftentimes what you end up thinking that it is is that it's something in them. So that's the first thing, that there's a conflict that needs to be resolved because they've sinned against you, which is definitely the case in, in some circumstances, but more often than not, there's something inside of you that has to be dealt with. So the false peace and the, the thing that you have to actually fight against is that there is something that you have to deal with in yourself, and it's actually not an issue with another person, and we'll get more into that in a little bit. So just to give you some examples on how this, on how this works, a few examples. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, Rachel and, and I were having a very difficult conversation. There were things that were, Rachel's my wife, in case you don't know. Um, we've been married for 22 years. And there, um, the way that we are both wired is that we are very opinionated and uh, strong-willed. We have a lot of opinions. Unfortunately for me, she's trained to argue, so I lose most of the time, um, but that's just, that's just life for me. So what had happened, though, is that there had, and Rachel, in our relationship, over time, there had been some things building up that for her, because she is mature in Christ, like, she does what she can to deal with what is her issue, and then what is really an issue between us, so that she doesn't just 
want to argue with me about everything because some things, as I said before, are like her issues to deal with and other things are actually things that I have done that's offended her. So I have been building up for a while and the way that the conversation went was there was this uh, lack of intimacy between us because she couldn't, there were like, you know, walls being built up and I know you all know what this is like. There's like walls being built up and because walls are being built up, you can't really be your true self in front of the one that you love. So there comes a point where it was like, okay, let's sit down and talk about this. And she's being honest with me about everything that, we're, that she's having issues with in my behavior. And that, so you would think that that would be, uh, that's not a very comfortable conversation. If you all have had this in your marriages, it's not comfortable, but it's necessary. And the way that it ended up, of course, is that, um, not of course, but it, the way that it ended up for us is that as we worked through the issues, the result of that was relief, peace, and intimacy. So you see this in chapter nine, relief comes up multiple times. So the way that um, Esther describes this situation, or Mordecai, who probably wrote the book, um, the way that Mordecai describes this is that it, it wasn't a victory. It was uh, relief that the Jews experienced. So for us, in that conversation, it was relief and there was a restored intimacy. So how, how often do you argue about things that are not really things, that are not really the things um, that you're dealing with? Uh, there's so often in my life, I have, you know, there's been an argument started and a few minutes into it, you forget what you're arguing about. Um, and you're like, what? I don't even remember what we started this argument about. That's an indication that you're not actually arguing about the thing that is the issue <laughs> if you're forgetting what you're arguing about. So how many of us really think that the bad, I'm going to stick with marriage for a bit, or maybe even kids too, but how often is the, the battle really about like, you know, you say, like, it's your turn to take out the trash. No, I took out the trash last time. It's your turn. And you, like, argue about this. I did the dishes last time. And it's your turn. No, I, no, it's your turn. And then you start keeping, like, a list. And, like, currently in our whole family, we have magnets on the side of the, of the refrigerator. And Rachel, like, came up with this thing where you move it around if you did your turn and you know, the next thing or whatever. But before something simple like that was installed, it was based on memory, and you would argue about these things that, it's like, really, is that what the argument is about? Are you really arguing about whether or not somebody forgot to take out the trash, or maybe there's something beneath the surface that you're arguing about? So to go a little bit further on that topic, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about work. So because people at my work may listen to this, sermon, we're just going to talk hypothetical for a second <laughs> about things that may happen in your work. Um, if you are in charge of people or a project lead on something that requires a deliverable, it is uh, frustrating at times when there are people that you rely on that do not meet your expectations, that are late to meetings, that are not prepared for meetings that do not deliver things that are up to your standards? And that, do you think that that provides conflict in your relationships with them and what your perceived relationship is with your work, especially if you are responsible for those projects? Of course, that that's conflict. And in order for true peace to occur, you must thoroughly and honestly deal with the conflict in front of you. So the part that's beneath the surface oftentimes is that our problem is not really with the people that may just not be up to the standards, that your standards. That the, the problem isn't necessarily with them. The problem is often with you and your expectations on other people. So that some of the things that you have to deal with in our relationships with people at work is, could it be that your issue is control? That people are not doing things the way that you would do them? Going back to marriage, that is basically the conflict in marriage your first 10 or so years is you're trying to get the other person to be just like you and when they're not, there's conflict because you think, you're, you think that the way that you do things is the right way. Of course, they're the right way. But it's, you know, you actually have a, another person in the mix who you don't want to be like you, but you fight because you try to make them like you. 
It's complicated. So anyways, back to work. You have people that are not delivering the way that you would want to deliver. So you get frustrated with them. So is the issue, though, that maybe you want to be uh, seen in a way with your boss that, like, you want to have favor from people. And the thing is that the people that you work with, are, that's external to you. Like, you cannot control them as much as you want to. You can somewhat in the way that maybe you train them or talk to them or whatever. But that's not a reflection on you. It's who they are. That's the way that they work. But our main conflict is not with them at that point. It is the way that you respond to things that are out of your control. And that's what we have to deal with. That's the honest and thorough part, doing work in your own heart in the way that you are gonna interact with people. All right, so that brings me to the second, so the, the thing is like all this stuff, most of it I would say is just blind spots in us and the way that we are dealing with things that are underneath the surface, that gets us to the second point within this idea of true peace. Community is necessary in our pursuit of peace. That's the second idea. Uh, you see this in chapter 9, as I've already highlighted, how the Jews gathered together to fight. You saw this in the story of Moses, how he had Aaron and her lifting up his hands uh, in battle. You see this all over Scripture, the, the need for community. And so the reality of our limited perception is that we are trying to deal with conflict in a thorough and honest way, uh, but the, the fact is that we need our brothers and sisters to help us see how maybe we are reacting to events around us when we should be looking at ourselves instead. And oftentimes that requires people that are willing to speak up and help you and help you see things the way that you should see them. This is the, the, this is the constant, this is definitely a constant in our life, how we will always be in conflict with the world around us. It's the human condition. We'll be in conflict with the way that people are treating us. We'll be in conflict with the sin nature inside of us, with the enemy, there's always conflict. And the reason that you can see things succeeding for the Jews in chapter 9 is because they gathered together and they defeated their enemy. Oftentimes, we need the same thing. We need to be gathering with people. So there's a couple of examples that I'll give on this. Um, so the first one is, so the, so the conflict part is not, it's not like that there's an enemy on the outside. It's just struggle. It's life. It's just the human condition that we go with. And one of the first examples I can think of, I mentioned it in the past, but our second son, um, our second son, he, um, he died at birth. And we knew about halfway through the pregnancy that the probable outcome was uh, fatal because of a birth defect. So this was an intense experience for us. And one of the most, I'd say one of the most real experiences in my life was sitting in a, um, it was sitting in a <clears throat> small group environment. I think every time I preach, I cry, I'm not, I think so. Um, so anyway, one of the most real experiences for us was sitting in a small group environment. Um, whenever <clears throat> our small group was praying over us, so it was like it was kind of like the uh, <clears throat> the story of uh, Moses. It was like they were lifting us up. So that's the kind of stuff that strengthens your faith when you're uh, walking through difficult situations. All right, so moving on. Um, so going back to our reference to God working uh, behind the scenes. So again, the story about the fear of Mordecai spreading uh, throughout the people. Uh, you can see in, in Deuteronomy 1.30, it says, the Lord your God who goes before you will fight, uh, will, uh, who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So you saw this happening in Mordecai. This happens, in, this happens all of the time. Uh, there have been occasions because of my role at the church um, as an elder where we're having to confront sin in people's lives when people are acting crazy. Um, and, you know, we just have to step into the situation 
And so I'm not just going to say this is like that I do it because people have had to do this to me where they're confronting me with sin. You kind of know that the conversation is coming up and it's going to be difficult. And the natural reaction that all of us have when we're dealing with difficult situations and actually being confronted with sin is that we will basically all the time react negatively to that, uh, defend ourselves, defend our self-righteousness and all these things. So you expect that the conversation that you're going to have when you're having to confront somebody with their sin is like that they're going to react negatively because, you know, you do the same thing when that happens to you. So there's a lot of prayer and talking about working with people, people walking alongside of you that are praying for you, that know that it's a difficult situation, that you know that the situation that maybe when you might be confronted with a difficult conversation, there's a lot of prayer that goes into it. What happens in those prayers is that God is going before you and fighting battles for you. And then really what results in, and that oftentimes, which is, it, it surprises me every time that it happens, is that these conversations are filled with grace and peace when you don't really think that it should happen that way because God is going before you. The last example that I'll just say is this week. Uh, this week, the elders have been dealing with some very heavy, heavy situations and maybe it's just because of me thinking about this in the sermon uh, this week and the idea of people walking alongside of you. Um, but there is something to be said about knowing that the people that you are uh, walking in this life with are praying for you, are alongside of you, and are with you no matter what. Uh, so that's that, that's been very helpful this week for us as we're dealing with a lot of difficult things. So that's people that are close to you, that care for you, that, um, that are in battle with you. Um, I think that I have time to do one more before I close up. Um, y'all all right with that? So it's either going to be... Uh, okay. Okay. I think I'll do this one here. So the third idea, this is the part that's a little bit difficult, and I actually want to read this. Um, this is not in the slides, uh, but it's the idea of like kind of what happened on that second day. Um, it's a kind of a little bit of a difficult situation to deal with sometimes because actually scholars, they will disagree on uh, what Esther did in asking them to, uh, so I don't have this on the slides, but I, but I do have it in my Google Notes, so... Um, all right, so this, what we're dealing with now is on the second day, how Esther decided to go after more people. And there are scholars that are disagree on whether or not that that was appropriate or not. And the, and the way that I'm going to go is that it was probably appropriate, and it's all because of what we di- the work that we did in Exodus and Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel and the consciousness of the Jews and the, necess- the necessity of putting up this, um, the ten sons of Haman as a sign and symbol. But these are two different perspectives, and I wanted to give them to you. You can kind of work through them yourself if you want to. So there's one that says, so this is, again, in reference to the, um, the second day. But the actions of Esther, this is the negative view. But the actions of Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews on the second day of the fighting lack any possible justification as they take advantage of Ahasuerus' weakness as a leader and eliminate anyone they consider an enemy. One cannot help but wonder what this victory might have looked like if the Jews of Esther's day had shown more faith in their ancestral God to deliver them from future attacks and had been concerned more for his fame and glory among the nations than for their own safety. So that's the negative view of their decision, which I don't agree with that. Um, Deborah Reed says in her commentary on Esther, this is the more positive view, in the light of Esther's heroine status within the story, it is probable more, probably more in line with the author's intention that Esther request, Esther's request is read in a positive rather than a negative light. Rather than being indicative of her bloodthirsty nature, it is more likely that the reader should notice Esther's determination to eliminate hatred against the Jews. She doesn't ask for a new edict, nor for license to do as she pleases. Instead, she operates within the confines of the edict Mordecai has already designed. Focusing on the remaining opposition in Susa, by hanging the bodies of Haman's sons, Esther will resolve the remaining tension in the story. Haman's body has been disgraced, but now the line of enmity 
there. And I think that I didn't copy the whole quote there. Sorry about that. But I think that you get the idea. Um, the reason that I would go with a more positive note is the story of Israel's battle against the Amalekites and how it was necessary, and that this is where I'll turn it to our own, our own lives, is that when we are dealing with sin, so we're walking in relationship with people, we're confessing sin, oftentimes what you do when you're confessing sin, as uncomfortable as it might be, you are putting your sin on display to people around you. And there's something good about that because that is a positive, would it be ne positive or negative deterrence? I don't know. Is positive deterrence a thing? You think positive? Negative? Okay, thanks. Negative deterrence to future uh, action with the same thing. If the people that you're walking in relationship with, this is the thing with our elder board, when we come in as an elder board, like, you know, you've got your qualifications as an elder. When you go in, we don't expect that everybody's going to be perfect. But what we do understand is where people tend to fall short when it comes to the qualifications of an elder. And when you can, lay, and when you can put that up in front of them and you start to, like my issue is like I like to be in control of things. And if I act out in a meeting and I'm trying to take control in a way that should, I should not be taking control, they have permission in my life to tell me to settle down a bit. And I don't have to defend myself and say that, no, this is not a control issue because it's already hanging in the gallows. Does that make sense? So that's the other, uh, other part that I would say. And it's also interesting, side note, back to seminary, uh, in the Hebrew itself, if you look at the Hebrew text, the 10 sons of Haman are not in a line the way that we see it in our scriptures. They are, they each have their own line. It's just, it's like they're calling it out. So that's kind of like another th reason that I think this is more of a positive implication of why the author includes this is because this is a very serious deal to the Jewish people to where they have their own lines, their own space in the text itself as a way to say that this, this, this has been dealt with. We're fulfilling the promise that God made, the commandment that God made to deal with the Amalekites. I think I'll be done there. Um, the, the way that I'll kind of close this out, this is very helpful that I've stapled this this time. Um, so the result of us being thorough and honest as we deal with our conflict, it's not butterflies and rainbows. Like that's not what we're promised when we deal with conflict. Um, what we're promised is peace. That's what we're promised when we deal with conflict in an honest and thorough way. It's a peace that passes understanding. It's true peace. The end of the story, it reveals that the Jews were experiencing welfare and peace, but of course that was only temporary. It would, it would be a few years later, rough history here, that the Romans would come in, take care of the Persians, and you know the, the Jews are still under the thumb of a brutal Roman empire. But 400 years after that happened, 400 years after this, the Prince of Peace would come. And the reality for us is that in the life that we live, we're always going to deal with conflict. And it's okay because we also know that it's temporary. Uh, we know it's temporary uh, because our peace and our expectations, uh, our life, it can be grounded in the Prince of Peace. This is where on the, the next slide, so we have our view of our, our position now in relation to peace. In Ephesians 2.14, it says, he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Romans 5.1 says that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is the peace with God and Christ that sets us free and gives us strength through the Holy Spirit to live a life free from the power of sin. Jesus is our peace. We are at peace with God. So then how should we live? This is the last verse of the day. In 1 Peter 3, 11, it says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So my question for you today is, for those that do not have the peace of God that are under his wrath. Um, will you turn from your sin today and trust in Jesus? He wants for you to come to him. 
He wants for you to have eternal life. If this is you, there's going to be people at the back that you can talk to and pray with. You can talk to me if you want to. Um, for those that do have peace, that are in Christ, before we go to the communion tables, so the question for you is, like, as you're, as you're talking uh, and thinking through uh, whether or not you're living in false peace, um, are there difficult conversations that you need to have today? Is there something that's been going on in your mind and heart that you need to own up to? Uh, has the Holy Spirit worked in your, in your heart to where, you know, you need to examine yourself and maybe there are conversations that you need to have to where you're dealing with real issues and not surface issues? This is not an easy uh, distinction to make, and it will take time. But if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, that this is something that, it, that you are doing, which we all do. But if there's specific things that you are dealing with, then determine and have people alongside of you that will help you in the journey. Okay? So let's pray, and we'll be done. Uh, Father, thank you for this day. I pray that you would help us to uh, be honest and thorough with the conflict in front of us. Um, I pray that you would speak to your people. I pray that you would uh, do a work in us, that we would follow you, that we would uh, daily face the, the, the sin that is dwelling within us and be serious about it. And I um, pray all of this in Christ's name, amen.
Family, can we pray together as we conclude our time? Jesus, we love you. You do have a powerful name. And you did a powerful work on that cross for us, Father. Not just covering in a small way our sin, but dealing with it completely. Father, propitiating it in full, dealing with every bit of wrath due us because of our rebellion against you, Lord, so that we can have unthinkable peace with you, Lord. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the finished work done there. And I thank you for the free grace extended to all who would come and receive it, Jesus. We thank you for this reminder from these pages of Esther, Lord, of a world filled with false peace, Lord, but a gospel that offers true peace. We thank you that you are a wonderful God, that you are a great redeemer, that you have a powerful name, and you've pointed it towards us. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Lord, as we go from this place, I pray for grace and power, Lord, and sensitivity in all of our lives. Father, I think we've all felt conviction from your spirit about the false peace that we're living in and different relationships, God. And I can sense your spirit leading towards healing towards health, and I'm grateful for that. Would you give us courage to deal with the things that are under the surface? Lord, would you give us boldness and a spirit of gentleness, Lord, as we seek that? And would you go before us, and would you make a way through the sea that we can't see? Lord, would we find ourselves, just as Tom described, pleasantly surprised by the way you work? Guide us, Jesus. We want to be your faithful people. It's in your powerful name that we ask all this. Amen. Amen, family. You guys can have a seat. Can we say thank you to Brother Watson for his good word today? Wherever you are, Tom, thank you. Uh, just a few announcements uh, I want to keep uh, in front of you guys. First off, the forum that we're having, Abortion in the Gospel, don't forget, that's next Sunday. So 5 o'clock p.m., you should have received a... Uh, information email. If you've signed up for that this past week, we'll remind you again this week about all the details. But today's your last chance to sign up if you have not already done so. This is a closed event. You cannot get in to the room unless you're on the list. And so that being true, uh, I want to encourage you once again, if you haven't signed up for whatever reason, but you'd like to join us, it's going to be a very important night for our church as we talk through a very complicated issue. I uh, would love to have you join. Just scan that QR code and you can sign up uh, right now, but again, that's today, uh, your last chance to do so. Next up, Growth Track is coming up in two weeks on August the 14th. This will be your next chance to uh, begin the membership process here at Emmaus Church. But even if you're not interested in becoming a member, if you're newer to our church and still want to understand more about who we are, what we believe, how our leadership structures work here, who are our elders, and, and how does all that work, uh, this is a great environment for you to get to hear a whole lot about who we are as Emmaus Church. And I want to, I want to encourage you to come. Uh, we provide dinner and child care for that environment. You just have to sign up. So Growth Track, that class, August the 14th, you can sign up with that QR code there on the slide. Um, and then the last thing uh, is this morning, I want to provide an update to you on our deacon ministry. Uh, we have put before some uh, candidates before you at the beginning of the summer and uh, want to take some next steps with all that. So check out this video as we sort of explain a little bit more about our deacon ministry. And then our head deacon, Pat, um, forgive me, our head deacon, Brad, will come up here and explain next steps. What's up, Emmaus Church? My name is Brad Hillman, and my family and I have the distinct joy of being covenant members here at Emmaus Church. One of the ways we serve the church is by leading the deacon ministry. The word deacon in scripture means servant or minister. We see the beginnings of deacons in Acts chapter six, verses one through six. In this passage, we see a gap in care for certain widows in the early church. The church leaders recognize this gap but realized they were unable to meet this need while also fulfilling their primary calling of preaching and prayer. They decided to raise up seven men to serve the church and meet this specific need. This moment gave rise to the office of deacon, which we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Deacons are the lead servants of the church. They serve the church by caring for those in need and meeting the tangible needs of the church for the glory of God and the good of the church. We are striving to accomplish this by utilizing specific ministry teams tailored to meet the needs both effectively and with the love of Christ. 
These ministries include the Embraced Ministry, specifically for single moms and widows, coming alongside them to meet whatever needs may arise. It includes Emmaus 127, a ministry committed to coming alongside fostering and adoptive parents. It includes our care ministry, which seeks to walk alongside and provide increased love and support to those in our congregation who are struggling. Lastly, it includes our special projects team, which exists to use our God-given talents to assist when specific skill sets are needed. So what does this mean for you? First, utilize the deacon ministry. We are here to meet the needs of Emmaus Church, but we must be made aware of needs in order to meet them. One easy way to utilize the deacon ministry is our second point. Utilize the website. Please head over to EmmausChurch.com. Right there on the homepage, you'll find a link to the deacon ministry, which includes a brief explanation of all of these ministries, a simplistic process to make your needs known, and even instructions on the application process to become a deacon for those interested. Even if you do not feel led to apply to be a deacon, we need all of you to utilize your specific skill sets to meet the needs of the church. Finally, please know how much we love you and love serving Emmaus Church. We can't wait to come alongside you to serve you for the glory of God and the good of the church. I'd love for you to go back to that website sometime today, review all the ways in which we'd love to serve you. Today we have the joy of installing three more deacons. We have uh, Jim Porter right here, and then we also have Trey and Andrea Mizell, as well as our elders. Just to give you a, a quick update or a quick uh, explanation of that, when you think of the difference between elders and deacons, the deacons lead the church by serving, and elders serve the church by leading. It's a really easy, simplistic way of understanding the difference between those two things. So we are going to uh, formally install them. There's nothing incredibly special about this other than the fact that uh, we just want you guys to know who your deacons are. We want to, to pray over them as they continue to serve this church. They've been faithfully serving the church for a very long time, but we would just like to formally do that. So for today, we have... Um, one of our elders, Bill Burke, he's going to pray and commission them, and then we'll pass it back to Pastor Brian. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that we are able to install Jim and Trey and Andrea as deacons in your church. We bring them before you, Lord, and um, we ask you to bless them um, as they step into this role. And we know, Lord, that um, being uh, appointed to formal positions of leadership in your church is not um, a destination, but rather it's the beginning of a, of a new journey uh, for them in, uh, in leading and serving uh, the people of your church. And we know that the journey at times will be difficult. At times it will be frustrating. And um, it will be a, a journey of self-discovery as well. And we pray, Lord, that you would grow them in their leadership abilities with the skills uh, that you've gifted them. Um, help them to be effective. Help them to continue um, to learn and to be in your word and to be in prayer continually on behalf of the people of Emmaus Church and uh, that you would you would form them and develop them into humble servant leaders as uh, your word describes deacons in the church that they would be examples of those um, type of leaders uh, protect their marriages Lord that we know the evil one would uh, would go to to the marriage and, and try to disrupt it when, uh, when we're stepping out in faith into a new area of responsibility, so protect their marriage. Um, give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts for the people of Emmaus that they can find their specific and unique role in serving your church and that they would be open 
to see where the needs are and to uh, fulfilling and meeting those needs. And I pray that you'd help them as we grow our deacon ministry to have important Im input into how this ministry would grow and how we could be even more effective in serving your people. So, uh, Lord, we put them before you, and as a church body, we uh, commit to supporting them and, and helping them in their new leadership role. Um, and we pray, Lord, that, um, that this would be a rewarding thing for them um, and effective ministry for our church. Be with them, guide them along the way, protect them, Lord, um, from evil, and guide them in the way they should go. We commit them to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> a few last things as we prepare to go. If this is your first time with us, again, welcome. Glad you were able to join us. Please stop by the Welcome Center as you exit so we can say hello and put a gift in your hands. Uh, and if you brought a, a gift of, of generosity with you this morning you'd like to give, uh, you can give that online always, of course, but we do have offering boxes at both of our doors as you exit. Uh, with that, next week, Pastor Anson will be back, Lord willing, as we kick off our, our next sermon series, Summer in the Psalms. Hope you can join us for that. We'll see you next week. You are dismissed.